Let's pray. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Heavenly Father, we pray for you to shine your light as we read your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning was the word. What an opening line. You can picture it maybe, can't you, on a, a scrolling screen at the beginning of a film. Or say it, you know, in your, in your head, maybe not out loud, or maybe when you're on, on out loud, in your best movie trailer voice. And it sounds epic, doesn't it? In the beginning was the word. But it's probably not where and how we'd start, is it? That is, if we were uh, explaining or sharing the message of Jesus with someone. Or, uh, you know, if you were to write a little, little book to give away at Christmas time. Or if someone were to ask you to share something at an event. Or, you know, you, a friend is curious about your beliefs. That's probably not where you'd start. And often, often with good reason. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because John did... That's where John began. The author of the fourth gospel helpfully tells us why he wrote the book. He tells us at the very end of the book, pretty much the end of the book, um, but he won't mind us sort of looking ahead, even though we're in chapter 1, he won't mind us looking ahead and seeing the spoiler. (coughs) Chapter 20, verse 31, he says, These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He wants people to believe And actually also to go on believing and so have life in Jesus' name. So we might think, well, why does he start with the stuff that, to be honest, sounds a little bit less believable? Imagine John a few weeks before his church's carol service. I've written a book that you can all give away to your friends. Oh, thanks, John. How does it begin? Well, verse 1, and we're into the mysterious nature of God himself. The word that was God and was with God. Of course, we'd want to steer well away from the Trinity, wouldn't we, as long as possible. Well, verse 3, and he's into the creation of the world. And, well, many of us would prefer to avoid that because it's too close to those difficult God and science discussions And then there's some really difficult stuff to understand about light and life. And then he introduces someone called John, who it turns out is not the John that the book is named after, confusingly. And while we're still figuring out the Johns, we're on to the incarnation. The word became flesh. God become man. At which point, I guess our only comfort would be that at least he doesn't mention the virgin birth. I mean, in this strange introduction, this strange prologue, as it is often called, John's prologue, this strange intro to his book, that he wants to help people to believe in Jesus through. He doesn't even call Jesus Jesus until verse 17, is it? And the the strangeness, the weirdness with what John has to say here, it's not just a modern day issue. But actually, in John's day as well, in the first century, many of these things in his prologue were were, were the more controversial things and and confusing and uncomfortable parts of the message of Jesus. So, for example, there were Greeks who believed in a a logos. That's the word for word that is there in verse 1. Many Greeks believed that there was a logos, a, a rational principle that stood behind all things, But the idea that that was a personal creator. Others believed all sorts of things about the creation of the universe. There were theories abounding in all kinds of different worldviews and belief systems and religions. But we can be sure that none of them placed a Jewish man from Nazareth at the center of that creation. People believed in many gods. Some even believed in one god. In John's day, but a God made human? 
Well, that was ridiculous to some and it was offensive to others, especially perhaps to John's fellow Jews. The claim that Jesus was God made flesh, that was why many of uh, his nation's leaders rejected Jesus and had him executed. Oh, and by the way, just for comfort, John sort of alludes to that fact as well in his intro. Uh, Now, part of it is that John wants to draw us in at the beginning. Almost every single phrase in this prologue of his is like a a link on on a web page that you click through to and you'd go to other parts of the rest of the gospel and have these things expanded and unpacked. And and I'm certainly not saying John is laying down here a, a, a tactic that we ought to always follow ourselves in our conversations with others. But the fact that this is where John starts in his book that he wants to use to help people believe, it ought to make us stop and think. John believes these things here in these first, 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 uh, these first 18 verses, he believes that they're not a barrier to faith in Jesus. And he isn't embarrassed by them. He isn't embarrassed that the message of Jesus will sound weird to people's ears the first time they hear it. And he doesn't try to hide that. He doesn't try to sort of dial that down. He doesn't mind that actually this stuff is going to blow minds and turn lives upside down because he thinks that's exactly what Jesus came to do. He doesn't think these things are a problem. He thinks they're a selling point. Sometimes I think we want to smooth the path, don't we, for people to faith in Christ. And we want to do that so much that sometimes we sort of obsess about, well, we've got to show them Christianity isn't weird and we've got to somehow make it all completely explainable and easy to swallow. And we get ourselves in danger of offering a Jesus that is, well, to be honest, that is a little bit vanilla. A little bit bland and safe and easy. As if Christ sort of comes to be an addition to the beliefs and the values and the lifestyle that we've all already got. A spiritual overlay on the lives that we already live. Well, do you know what? That's not good for us as we seek to follow the way of faith in Jesus through our lives. And it's certainly not good as we seek to share Jesus with others because, let's be honest, isn't the real Jesus far better than that? The real Jesus, the Jesus we're going to encounter in this intro to John's gospel throughout December. He, he messes with us, doesn't he, far more than that easy to swallow Jesus. He turns things upside down and inside out. He unsettles the way we think about life and the way we put life together. He turns upside down things that we think we already know and he makes us look at it again. Knowing him is this glorious disruption A disjunction leading to a lifelong overhaul that ultimately changes everything. And yes, we will end up concluding that all of that upheaval and all of that disruption has actually just brought us home to where we always should have been. But that's not because Jesus has left us where he found us. John's prologue invites us to consider that maybe what is weird in the good news of Jesus is wonderful. Maybe what's different is delightful. Actually, in these verses, God himself invites us into what is delightfully different in Jesus and invites us to embrace it, or or better still, to be embraced by it. To dive in because the water is lovely. And as we swim around in these verses... These next few weeks, let's pray that our hearts will be thrilled with Jesus once again. In such a way that that spills over into all the opportunities that we'll have to speak of him during this season. Well, today we're just in the first five verses and we're going to see three things that, that are delightfully different in Jesus. Jesus gives us a delightfully different God, a delightfully different world. And a delightfully different story that we're living in. First of all, a delightfully different God. A God we can know. A God we can know. Verse 1, if it were the opening line of a film, 
then you would probably be forgiven in the first century, especially if you were a Jewish person, for thinking this film is a remake. Because verse 1 is almost lifted from the beginning of something else, from the beginning of the book of Genesis. We read it, didn't we, in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis, which means beginnings. And so this, like Genesis, is a story of beginnings. It's an origin story. Only the funny thing is, it turns out it's not Jesus' origin story, which is what we might expect from a gospel, isn't it? Certainly that's what happens in the other Gospels, isn't it? We get angels and pregnancies and Bethlehem, uh, all to introduce us to Jesus. Whereas John starts his origin of Jesus by saying the interesting thing about him is he doesn't really have an origin. Not in that way. He introduces us to someone called the Word who has always existed. In the beginning was the Word. Genesis 1 verse 1 said, in the beginning God John 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And this word somehow is related to God. Eternally, he was in the beginning with God, before anything else. And intimately, he was was with God, that is beside God, close to God, nearby God. Related to God, eternally and intimately, and yet also, John says, the word was God. God. I said, John dives us straight in, verse 1, into the mysterious nature of God himself. That somehow within the one God, there are eternal relations and multiple persons. We scratch our heads and, and, and well, we might. I mean, but what do we expect? Do we really think the creator of everything that is ought to be sort of so simple that we can just sort of nail him down in a few sentences? We ought to be suspicious, didn't we, of a, of a God that was that easy to encapsulate. That's the kind of God that you could just make up. But actually, John's point in talking about the Word is not just to show us that this is a God who, who's got depth that we cannot fathom, but actually to show us that that God with depth that we can't fathom is knowable. All the way through the Old Testament, the Lord... God was different from all the gods of the nations because he was truly knowable and he was truly knowable because he spoke. He spoke and made himself known and revealed his plans and his ways and disclosed his character and revealed himself to people. He spoke. And so, for example, sometimes in the Old Testament we read things like this, the word of the Lord came to the prophet so-and-so. The word of the Lord came to Abraham And you find yourself thinking, is the word of the Lord a person? The word of the Lord came to the prophet or to Abraham or whoever. Is the word of the Lord a person or does it just mean that God got his message to them? And John says, yes. Within the one God, there is this person called the word. Who is the message of God. The speech of God. God's own self-communication. The Word, God made known. A God we can know. Later on, he'll, in the prologue, we'll get to these verses later on in December, he'll expand that even more and he'll say that that Word became flesh and the result of it was that we could see his glory, the very glory of God itself. God made known. A God we can know. Delightfully different from the nations around us. Delightfully different from our our default when it comes to God. Meet Jesus, John is trying to tell us here. Meet Jesus and there can be no more talk of, uh, oh well, if there is a God then. And neither can there be any talk of, well, I like to think of God as. No, God has spoken the word. And the word has become flesh. And so too, gone is any grounds for saying, well, there cannot be a God if we meet Jesus, the Word made flesh. There's no need for guessing. There's no need for grasping around in the dark. However, we might like to think of God if we were left to ourselves. John says, think again. In the beginning was the Word. God speaks and makes himself known. Jesus, the Word made flesh, is the right place to start with our definition of God. 
not sort of up here in our imaginations. We start with Jesus. In Genesis, God spoke all things into existence. And so John again sort of says, well, let's do a close angle zoom on that. Verse 3, all things were made through him, this word. And without him was not anything made that was made. There's everything that has been created in one column, isn't there? And then there is the creator. Everything created. And the only one uncreated is the creator. And John very firmly puts the word on the creator side of that divide. So it's not that he's sort of the top of the created things list, the first created thing. No, no, no. Nothing that was made was made without him. So he's on this side of the column. And everything that was made was made through him. He was totally involved in the creation of the universe. Every single part. And that brings us to a very different, a delightfully different world. Jesus gives us a delightfully different world that we are in. The world looks different from the perspective of John 1 verse 1 to 5. This is an origin story, as I've said, but it's not Jesus' origin story, not really. It turns out it's the origin story of everything, the origin story of the universe. In the beginning was the Word, and everything was made through Him. Everything that is, wherever we might imagine that that came from, and imagine how that came to be, John says, think again. It came through the Word. Whatever we might have been told, however we might attempt to describe what that might look like, the fundamental building block is this. Everything was made through God, the Word. Do you know, things start to look different, don't they, when we accept that. It means this universe is not here by chance. It means it's not here because of chaos. It's not here because of impersonal forces or laws were grinding their way on. We live in a universe that has its origin in in intelligent and personal divine speech. It means there's something fundamentally personal about this universe that we live in. Even when we're sort of out in the cold, far-flung, darkest reaches of space, this universe is the result of God's personal speech. delightfully different there's going to be therefore there's going to be order isn't there if everything was made through the word this universe is going to have an order to it and a logic there's going to be a meaning to this if this is all the result of personal divine speech there's a meaning to this universe that we're in there's a purpose to it and it means there's something as i've said inherently personal about the whole universe we could put it like this we could say the universe is god's poem Creation is God's poem, created through his word, authored according to his rhymes and his rhythms. Through his word, he made all things. That probably changes the way we look at everything, doesn't it? Everything crafted according to the rhyme and the rhythm of the creator. If only we could somehow know, begin to know and see and learn that rhyme and rhythm. Boy, we'd be able to put life together, wouldn't we? We'd be able to put life together well. John says, good news, you can. Because this origin story, if it's the origin story of all things, that includes you and I. And John says, you and I have an important part in this creation. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The word is the source of life, but especially our life. That life was the light of men. That is of humanity, that means, the human race. He's saying that there is anything to be seen and that we can see it is down to the word. All that we know and the fact that we can know it is down to the word. Humanity has a unique place in all that's been created. They're created to be recipients of the words light and life in a unique way. If he is, if we can put it like this, if he is the message, we were created to be those who would hear that message. If 
If he is the light, we were created to be those who were enlightened, who saw everything by his light, including, of course, the light himself, because we were supposed to trace those beams back to their source. Knowing God through Jesus, in other words, is going to end up changing the way we see everything, because he's the light. No wonder, isn't it, that we get ourselves in such a mess if we try and put the world and put ourselves and put life together without his light. That would be like trying to get dressed in the dark, wouldn't it? Maybe worse. And that takes us to the third thing. In Jesus, we get a delightfully different story. In Jesus, there's a delightfully different story that we're living. In a world that was made uh, by the light of the word and was made to be filled with the light of the word, in that world, nevertheless, there is darkness, says John. There is darkness. Verse 5, not just the absence of light, but opposition to the light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's as if he's saying there's a cosmic struggle between darkness and light. And, and humanity, we're, we're caught up in that struggle. We're participants in that battle. That's the story we're living in. If we were to click on that word darkness in John's prologue there, we'd be taken all different places in the book and we'd see all kinds of things about darkness. We'd see how darkness is connected to unbelief and how darkness is connected to sin and how people prefer the darkness because they don't like the way the light shines on them and shows up what they're doing. And so we turn our backs on the light. Whatever else we might have heard about this story that we're living in, it boils down to this. You see, everyone agrees there's something wrong, don't they? But people disagree on what it is that's wrong with this world in which we're living. Well, it boils down to this, says John. Yes, humanity is made for the light, but we cover our eyes. We were made to be recipients of the word, but we stuff up our ears. That's the story we're in. If you like, it's a story in which the characters uh, have tried to mount a rebellion against the author. Many people live as if there is no author. Many people deny that there is even a story. Many people live in the darkness of lies about the author and hate him. There is darkness. And humanity are participants. And of course in the darkness all sorts of things happen. All sorts of evils, natural evils and moral evils are allowed to grow up. All sorts of tragedies grow in the darkness. Turn away from light and life. We get darkness and death. Whatever is wrong with the world. Whatever else can be said in analysis of the ailments of our age. Whatever else we can say about what's wrong with our country, wrong with our neighborhood. Whatever else we might say needs fixing in the world. There, this is where it all boils down to. There's a cosmic struggle between light and darkness. And the human race, we're caught up in that. We're participants. But don't think, John says, don't think. And this is why it's a delightfully different story. Don't think that those... But those forces are equal. It's not light and dark like Star Wars light and dark, that they're in balance. The light and the dark are not equal opposites. Or as John would put it, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Darkness cannot penetrate light, but light penetrates darkness. They're not equal opposites. The darkness would like to snuff out the light, but it cannot. The light wins. We see this every single day, what John is talking about. We see it in the fact that whatever darkness there is, there is still light, because this is still God's world. However, we might like to sort of mess with the rhythm and the rhyme, there is still poetry in this world, because the author spoke it into existence. It's like God, in his kindness, holds us back from the full implications of our plunge into darkness. 
We close our eyes, but of course the light still peeps through. We stuff up our ears, but we can't help but still hear some of what is being said. This is why we still have loving relationships and and, and all sorts of learning and and knowledge and human brilliance and law and order a lot of the time and, and the benefits of modern dentistry and many other things. Theologians like to talk about God's common grace. John says the light shines in the darkness. But he means more than just that as well. He means more than just that because as he'll unfold in the rest of this prologue, he'll say that the light shines in the darkness because the light came into the world in verse 9. The light came into the world. And yes, darkness did its best to extinguish him, but it failed. We fast forward through the gospel and in the dark of night, they take Jesus the light and they try to bury him beneath their lies and bury him in death. And buried he was. But this new beginning that John is writing about is just like it was in the beginning. There was darkness, but then there was light. There was evening, and then morning. And so on a new first day, the light rises. The word made flesh is resurrected, never to die again. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light continues to shine in our darkness today. That's the story we're in, says John. Darkness to light. A rescue story, a restoration story, a retrieval and a revival story and all sorts of other good things that maybe don't have to begin with R. A story in which things have gone wrong. Yes, but that is not the end of the story. A story with the original happy ever after up ahead. You might be thinking of all the ways that there are of telling the story that we're living in, but none of them has hope like this. That's the difference. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's John's message to us and our hearts. That's our message to people around us this Christmas, isn't it? Let's pray. moment of quiet and I'll lead us in prayer and then we'll stand uh, to sing in him was life and the life was the light of men the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it Heavenly Father, help us as we head into the week ahead. And we're sure, that we're sure there will be plenty of ways that we can see darkness around us and even darkness within us. Help us to see your light and by that light to see everything else. Help us to see the Lord Jesus and his victory. Help us to see the Lord Jesus and his restoration. Help us to see Jesus and his redemption in our lives uh, in the week ahead and help us as we seek to share that with others too in his worthy and precious name amen